Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the G2M transition of the cell cycle. Okay, so we haven't actually discussed the G2M transition, but at the moment I'm just sort of um, talking about the general cell cycle so that we can build up this gradual picture and put everything together, basically, uh, because I don't want you just to know uh, isolated bits of the cell cycle in isolation and not have the picture sort of joined together. So I want to um, join bits together as we go along. So we're recapping at the moment the G1S transition. Okay, so we've seen that towards the end of G1 phase, the levels of cyclin E CDK2 spike, basically. The, this causes uh, the inhibition of the P27 protein, which means that the CDK4 enzyme is now activated. CDK4 can then bind with cyclin D, and this cyclin D CDK4 complex is then capable of phosphorylating the retinoblastoma protein, inhibiting it, and it then releases its cargo, which is this E2F DP complex. Okay, we've also seen that the cyclin E CDK2 is also actually capable of directly phosphorylating the retinoblastoma protein and therefore also releasing the E2F DP complex. So, we now need to see what this E2F DP complex is actually going to do. Okay, right, so let's draw it out here. So let's say this is our E2F DP complex, and I've forgotten what colours we drew it in. It was green and orange, I believe. Orange was E2F. Right, so this is our E2F DP complex. So in orange, this is the E2F transcription factor here. And in green, this is the uh, dimerization partner of the E2F transcription factor. Okay, right, so we've got our E2F DP complex. Now, this is basically a very powerful transcription factor. So once it's been released by the retinoblastoma protein, it's going to translocate into the nucleus of the cell. So let's say here is the nucleus of the cell. Okay. And it's going to bind to the promoter region of certain genes. So let's say this is a gene here. Well, this is a piece of DNA, actually. And uh, basically, upstream of most G of in fact all genes in the uh, human genome what you have is a region known as the promoter region okay so let's say this here represents our gene in this box so this is the gene and let me give it a color I'll color it in red okay so this is the gene and upstream of the gene what you have is a region known as the promoter region or the promoter box some people call it Okay, so this is the promoter region, and I'll color that in as well. So this is the promoter region. Now, the promoter region is not coding. The gene is basically the bit that's actually going to be read by the ribosome and is then going to make the protein. Uh, the tr promoter region is not involved in actually making the protein, and I'll color the promoter region in pink. The promoter region is involved in recruiting the RNA polymerase enzyme to the gene, basically. And remember, the RNA polymerase is the enzyme which will come and it will um, copy, well, it will make a copy of the DNA, basically. It will make a RNA, uh, an RNA strand which is complementary to the coding strand of the DNA. Okay? Uh, so, uh, if you want to increase the expression of your gene, i.e. you want to increase the amount of the gene uh, product for which this gene encodes, then you need to increase the amount of mRNA you're making from this gene. So you need to increase the amount of, uh, of times that the RNA polymerase is going to come and transcribe this gene. And basically the RNA polymerase docks on the promoter region. So if you can do something to the promoter region that makes uh, the RNA polymerase like to dock there more, i.e. increase the affinity of this promoter region for the RNA polymerase, then you can increase the amount of mRNA you produce and therefore increase the amount of gene product you produce. So this is what this E2F um, dimerization partner transcription factor is going to do. It's going to come along it's going to bind to this promoter region here. So this is in green, uh, and the E2F transcription factor is in orange. So it's going to come along, bind to this promoter region, and it's going to increase the affinity of RNA polymerase uh, for binding to that promoter region, basically. 
and uh, that will increase the expression of certain genes. So the, um, the promoter regions that E2F binds to are going to have their expression, uh, well, exp the expression of the downstream gene is going to be increased. And one of these such genes that is going to have its expression increased is a protein known as cyclin A. Okay, so if we now extend our graph of the different, oh, actually we'll, we'll, we'll just talk about what cyclin A does at first, and then we'll extend that graph of the different cyclin-dependent kinases that I said reminded me of the menstrual cycle. Okay, so cyclin A basically is a protein that's going to bind to another cyclin-dependent kinase and is going to activate it basically to have certain activity. And this really is where, when it becomes really important for you to understand that it is not the cyclin-dependent kinase alone that has its activity. Its activity is completely and utterly controlled by the, well, mediated by the cyclin that binds to it. Because the cyclin-dependent kinase that this cyclin A is going to bind to is one that we've met already. It's cyclin-dependent kinase, or CDK2, which we've already seen. We've already seen cyclin E bound to CDK2, which we called the G1S CDK. But now we've got cyclin A bound to CDK2, and the function of cyclin A CDK2 complexes is very different. So this overall is a cyclin A CDK2 complex, and this again has another name. It's basically the archetypal um, cyclin-dependent kinase of the S phase. So this is known as S CDK. Okay, and we'll add it to our graph in a moment and see how its levels alter uh, as the cell cycle goes along. So, let's give it some colouring in first. So, cyclin A will colour in blue here. Okay, and then uh, cyclin-dependent kinase 2 uh, will colour in... Um, what colour should we give cyclin-dependent kinase 2? We'll colour it in yellow, maybe. Uh, oh, actually, maybe we should colour it in the same colour as the previous one was. Oh, it was blue. What a... <laughs> how unfortunate. Uh, we'll colour it in yellow, then. I'm not colouring both of them blue. Um, right, so it's, they've swapped over. Okay, so this is our uh, cyclin A CDK2 complex, or this S CDK. And now if we extend this graph of the different levels of the cyclin-dependent kinases as time goes by, so let's say this is the G1 phase, this is the S phase of the cell cycle, and this is the level of CDK on the y-axis, then what we saw was that as G1 progresses, the level of the, um, the, level of the cyclin DCDK4 complexes, or the G1 CDK, goes up. And in fact, this remains high throughout all of S phase. Okay, so this, this graph here represents the G1 CDK, or that other name for it, the more common name now, was um, cyclin D um, CDK4 complexes. Okay, right. Now, we'll add on our G1S CDK, which remember was this cyclin E CDK2 complex, which just spiked at the G1S transitions. This was our uh, G1S CDK, or our uh, cyclin, e, um, C cyclin E CDK2 complex. Okay, and now let's add on our third one, this S CDK, which is our cyclin A CDK2 complexes. Well, basically what's going to happen is it's going to come up in S phase, like so. So it's going to come on in S phase, and this is going to carry out uh, the uh, beginning, well, it's going to trigger the starting of DNA replication, basically. This SCDK does everything that's, uh, that triggers S phase, pretty much. Okay, right, so uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.